So, so let's talk about heresium. Traditional use, if you look at the way that it was used um, in the Chinese Materia Medica, they said of it that it nourishes the gut, it promotes good digestion, um, was used for ulcers, was used for chronic gastritis. And there's also, uh, not only did they use it for cancer, but there's always also a body of research developing for heresium on, um, on cancer, on anti-cancer activity. It's also, in the Chinese lore, good for the five internal organs, liver, lung, spleen, heart, and kidney. Great for general vigor and for strength and for nutrition. And we tend to forget this about mushrooms, but they have nutrients. And I'll, I'll say just a hair about that as we go forward here. But it's also known for its effects on the central nervous system. And this is where we'll focus today. So things like insomnia, um, for vacuity, which in, in the Chinese system basically means weakness, uh, for hypodynamia, also uh, an old eclectic term that was often used. So this gives us a sense of how it was used. And this is one of the things, whenever you look at medicinal plants and you want to start thinking about them clinically, go back and look at the traditional literature. Don't get completely lost in the scientific literature because the traditional literature will often lead you to a place that can be more informative in terms of uh, beyond the research models. So let's talk about the chemistry and the pharmacology of this particular plant. Now, we basically have, we can divide this with, a, with two big umbrellas, high molecular weight and a lower molecular weight. And these higher molecular weight compounds are the polysaccharides. And the mushrooms are really well known for their polysaccharides. The beta-glucans are um, often used as uh, immunomodulating agents or immunostimulating agents. The low molecular weight compounds, which we're particularly interested in, where the research has been focusing, are not only the polyketides, which we won't talk about too much, but the terpenoids. And the terpenoids are of interest. Now, you'll, you've probably heard about terpenes before from different plants, but the terpenes we're going to be talking about are less understood in other plants. And this plant, they're actually developing quite a body of, of information. So if we look at, um, look at it from a, a flow chart, We'll, we'll, we'll touch on the polysaccharides. They're of interest, and they do have neurological activity. But really what we're interested in here is the diterpenoids. And that's where I'll spend most of my time today. Also, there are sterols, and we'll, we'll say a little more about sterols in the next lecture. I won't touch on it too much here. And as I mentioned, there's nutrients as well. So let's start with the polysaccharides and, and get, jump right into um, neurological activity. So in studies that were done on uh, amyloid protein, amyloid beta protein, we'll find that the cells were, the, in cells that were actually toxic from an, amyloid, the lion's mane polysaccharides actually decreased the production of reactive oxygen species from about 80% to about 58%. And that's in a dose-dependent manner, of course, the pharmacological uh, gold standard. And it also increased the efficacy of the free radical scavenging, which, which you would expect. And that's an in vitro model. Um, and I will, I will tell you as we go through these where, where we're talking animal, human, and, and in vitro. Um, also, you see promoted cell viability when cells are uh, challenged with amyloid beta. So this also suggests uh, potentially useful uh, activity and protection against apoptosis as well. Uh, again, in a response to amyloid beta. You also see polysaccharides that have significant anti-fatigue, and this isn't an, uh, anti-fatigue. Excuse me, this isn't unusual. You'll see, for example, um, mushrooms such as Ganoderma lucidum or reishi having some very significant anti-fatigue activity. A purified polysaccharide from a liquid culture broth. This will be mycelia, and I want to stop here and just give you a quick mycelia versus fruiting body. So when we're talking about mushrooms. We have fruiting bodies, that's what you see, that's, the, that's what you eat in a salad, right, that are cut up, fruiting bodies. But you also have mycelia, or mycelium, you'll hear it called. Now, mycelia is the, the spores that grow and it will eventually give rise to a fruiting body. And so you've got really two sets of products on the shelves these days. You've got mushrooms that are fruiting body uh, products, and you've got mushroom products that are mycelia products. And they can be very, very, very different. And so we, we should be aware of this as, as we go through this. And so I will distinguish between fruiting body and mycelia as we go through this. And the chemistry will be different as well in these, in these products. And we'll touch more on products and chemistry in a few minutes here. 
Um, so polysaccharides, in this case, the mycelia were more effective to control or nerve growth factor um, or a brain-derived neurotrophic factor alone in enhancing the growth, growth of rat adrenal nerve cells and neurite extensions. So neurite extension, of course, is dendritic growth is what we're think, thinking about here. When we get to the terpenoids, we're basically looking at two classes of terpenoid compounds. And, and I'm going to use Dr. Jim Duke's pronunciation here of these compounds because I always like his second syllable emphasis. But uh, heresinones and iranacines ir, 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 as well. Iranacines and heresinones is what we're interested in here with these terpenes. And these are these diterpenes that look to be very, very interesting. And they tend to stimulate uh, nerve growth factor very significantly. And so this is where I said the chemistry gets different. In the mycelia, we'll find that we have more irinacines, and in the fruiting bodies, we have more uh, heresinones. But they're both active, and they're both shown to cross the blood-brain barrier. So this is going to be very important when it comes down to, to therapeutics. Also, we see neurotrophic activities, and I'll go through some of this research with you, um, from both of these sets of compounds, from both of these families of compounds. Now, these heresinones and irinacines are um, families. This isn't just two different compounds. These are families of compounds. And this will get to a place where we start thinking about, well, we've got irinacines of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, right? So we have this whole family of compounds. And what's interesting is many of them are active. So if we use the standard pharmacological model where we were looking for a, a gem in a jungle, we would throw out everything except what worked in our model. And in this case, and in, actually in most medicinal plants cases, this would be an error. Because plants don't make just one active compound. They make multiple octave compounds. This is the rule, not the exception with, uh, with lion's mane. Um, here's the errant. Iranacine A, isolated from mycelia of, uh, this is mycelia, so uh, providing neuroprotection and potent nerve growth factor uh, enhancing effects. Also, the same compound, increase the level of nerve growth factor in the locus ceruleus as well as the hippocampus. Um, this study shows, uh, and this is actually fairly recent, you're going to find that most of the research on lion's mane is fairly recent. It's, it's, it, although it's been around and used in traditional medicine for li literally thousands of years, what we are f finding is that suddenly science has taken an interest in, in this particular uh, mushroom. So in this particular study, what did they see? They showed that the mycelium has, has, uh, has shown a reduction of infarct volumes in global ischemic stroke models by 22% at 50 milligrams a kilogram. And so let's stop right there. So I'm guessing that most of you probably haven't done animal research. Um, 50 milligrams a kilogram in an animal model is actually a physiologically realistic dose. Not necessarily that we're going to take that much as humans. And remember, this, this doesn't translate. You have to use the human equivalent dose. So uh, mouse, metabolism, mouse metabolism is about seven times faster than human metabolism. So you, you have to be very careful here. You can't translate animal doses to human doses. So this would actually end up being a lower dose in humans. But 50 milligrams a kilogram is significant. And 22%, if you could in increase, uh, decrease infarct volumes by 22% in a loved one, uh, I think all of us would agree that we could. Now, when you get to 300 milligrams a kilogram, they showed 44% uh, reduction in this infarct volume. But I'm going to tell you that I'm a little skeptical about how physiologically relevant those kinds of doses are you'd be taking very massive doses. And if you look at this chart here, and of course a, a graph or a chart sums it up all nice for you. The SAM there that you see, the black, I don't know how well you can read that. Can you read that? Is it just too small for you? Murmur, murmur. Can you read it? Thank you. Okay. So uh, SAM is stroke animal model. So that's your, that's your control group that actually has got infarct volume uh, reduction. And then you see the, re, the, the decrease of that, re, that infarct volume with hericium at 50 milligrams a kilogram, at 300 milligrams a kilogram. And then notice that they use um, one compound in there, irinacine A, at one milligram a kilogram. That is really a minuscule dose. And so that becomes very, very physiologically 
relevant and very physiologically exciting, pharmacologically exciting, I'll say. Um, and you see this affects two different areas that they looked at, subcortex and the cortex. So strong, strong effects here. And how did it happen? If you look at uh, their model, they're talking about a reduction in uh, basically blocking these, uh, like the in induction of nitric oxide synthase, uh, P38, MAPK, which basically is a, a, a protein that responds to cytokines and ultraviol ultraviolet radiation, heat shock, basically stress. And then CHOP also very big in this uh, process as well, another gene regulating compound. Basically, all, if you're blocking these compounds, you're reducing reactive oxygen species. And when you have infarct uh, issues, really what you're doing is generating a huge amount of reactive oxygen species. So you're just, it's just messy. It's, it's hot, inflamed, boggy, and messy. And so to be able to reduce that is very, very significant. Now, if we turn to arenosine um, C, we'll see, also see some activity here. In this particular model, it showed the strongest inducing effect on nerve growth factor synthesis, indicating a very high potential to treat nervous diseases, of course, such as Alzheimer's disease. And then arenosine P, um, and, and arenosine P can actually be converted in the body to arenosine A and arenosine B. So again, I'd point out to you that if we had a pharmacological model, we would have thrown arenosine P out because we would have looked at arenosine A or we would have looked at arenosine C and we would have seen some activity. And so we would have lost something in terms of the whole plant activity. Now arenosine Q also is of interest and also has shown nerve growth factor activities. And now we turn to the uh, hericinones and the hericinones such as hericinone E also stimulates nerve growth factor secretion. Um, twofold higher than that of a positive control. For positive control in, in a lot of these studies, they use epinephrine. And you may not think of epinephrine as stimulating nerve growth factor, but it actually, it does. And it, and it makes sense if you think about um, fight or flight, if you're in danger, you want, some, you want your brain uh, basically on steroids. You want it remembering everything that's around you, right? Because you, if you ever repeat that experience, you want to not have that experience. So norepinephrine and epinephrine will, will really uh, cause acute retention of certain memories. Um, and then this paper actually just came out and um, uh, the moderator, uh, moderator of, uh, of these conferences, uh, Jen Palmer, Dr. Palmer, is actually very kind to me because she always lets me add things at the last second. So this is a 2017 paper um, that just came out and it's, it's showing a very significant effect on an enzyme that has a, uh, a effect of breaking up amyloid precursor protein into amyloid plaque. And so to be able to block that effect, of course, would be very, very significant. We'll talk more about amyloid plaque here in a second. Um, we may be chasing the wrong thing in terms of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, I would just state now we're definitely chasing the wrong thing.